to you about the important clinical entity of the abdominal compartment syndrome. It's very important when you're on this rotation to think about it. Think about it before your patient develops shock, before they develop oliguria. Think about it in any patient at all, but certainly in any patient that's had abdominal surgery and comes out. You are well within your rights to coordinate with the nursing staff and obtain a baseline bladder pressure on a patient who's had abdominal surgery when they first arrive in the intensive care unit. It's important that you remember this because the abdominal compartment syndrome is a crucial cause of non-cardiogenic obstructive shock. And by the time it's clearly shock, it's often too late. What I need you to remember is that a patient who you are taking care of who has oliguria, some degree of hypotension, high peak airway pressures, high central venous filling pressures, check a bladder pressure. And if it's greater than 20 with any evidence of organ dysfunction, you have the abdominal compartment syndrome. When you have the abdominal compartment syndrome, your focus should be to think about medical and non-medical management while you are coordinating closely with the attending surgeon and their team. Medically, you should think about things like sedation, paralysis, possibly paracentesis, possibly diuresis. Um, and when you're focusing in on those issues, think about NG tube suctioning and rectal decompression while you're working with the surgeon to see if after that intervention, the patient still needs to have an evaluation for potentially opening the abdomen. Respiratory distress syndrome is our next topic. This is very exciting to me, it's very important to me, and it's very important that I share with you how intensivists think about this disease entity. The first thing is the definition. So the correct clinical scenario, usually direct or indirect lung injury, bilateral, usually asymmetric infiltrates, no obvious evidence of left atrial hypertension, and that does not mandate the use of a pulmonary artery catheter, and most recently, using the Berlin definitions, there's criteria for hypoxemia based on the PaO2 FiO2 ratio. 300 to, 300 to 200 is mild ARDS, 200 to 100 is moderate ARDS, and less than 100 is considered severe ARDS. That is how ARDS is diagnosed. There's no serum marker, there's no other blood tests, you don't need to do a bronchoscopy. That's how you diagnose a patient with acute respiratory distress syndrome. And what I want to show you here is called the ARDSNET protocol. It, is it has been a standard of care for management of patients with ARDS since the year 2000. And it's still important and it's still strongly recommended. When you want to manage a patient with this, work with your respiratory therapist. It's at the bedside on every patient. The concept is low tidal volume ventilation, with a target tidal volume of 6 mLs per kilo predicted body weight. And there's equations that can be used that are up here to tell you that. Um, I use a program called MedCalc, and that's how I determine what the target tidal volume is. It tends to be around 300 to 350 milliliters. And then importantly, this is helpful. And you can pick, usually in this unit, we use this combination of FiO2 and PEEP. This is the lower PEEP, high, or higher FiO2 ladder, where your targets are what really matter. It's a PO2 of 55 to 80 and an O2 sat of 88 to 95%. That's your targets when you're managing a patient with the acute respiratory distress syndrome. And so if you start out and the patient is on, and what I see all the time that you shouldn't be doing is have the patient on 100% oxygen and a PEEP of 5. That's simply wrong. It's not correct. It's erroneous. So you should be thinking here, if you're on 100%, then you should be on a PEEP of 18 time as the patient starts to improve. So if you said, well, I don't want to be on 100%, let's try 70% and a PEEP of 10, well, then you're in that box. And if you're doing well, then you can come down to a 70 to 60% and a PEEP of 10, and 50% and a PEEP of 10, and then 50% and a PEEP of 8. You get the idea. So what I like about this protocol is that A, it's evidence-based, B, it allows everybody on the team to be on the same page in terms of safely and in an evidence-based fashion managing their patients with the acute respiratory distress syndrome. 
There will be times where working with your intensivist, you may be on other modes. You may be on pressure control ventilation. You may be on APRV or bivent or bilev. That's fine. But what you need to leave this rotation understanding is that the ARDSNET protocol is a reasonable, internationally accepted approach to ventilating patients with the acute respiratory distress syndrome. This video by talking with you about two important patient safety bundles. The first is the IHI, Institute for Healthcare Improvement, patient safety bundle focused in on prevention of what are called CLABSIs, or catheter-related bloodstream infections. There are five components. Wash your hands, which is super important. Clean the site with chlorhexidine. That you try to put in an IJ or a subclavian line over a femoral line whenever possible. Although the data behind that is surprisingly controversial. This is not controversial. Hat, mask, gown, gloves, and full coverage of the patient. And in our other video orienting you to the ICU, we will show you where you go get the appropriate equipment to perform this procedure and daily evaluation of the need for vascular access and removal as soon as possible. Also importantly, the nurses are empowered to stop placement of a central line if proper procedure is not being followed. Again, these are very important. You will hear me talk about this over and over again on rounds. I'm excited about two things, well, many things, but two important things, taking out central lines and stopping antibiotics. The other patient safety bundle is what is still considered the standardized checklist for patients to prevent ventilator-associated events. Some of these might be confusing to you as to why they would prevent ventilator-associated events, but they're really a checklist for patients on the ventilator. So for example, DVT prophylaxis, assess every patient every day, coordinate closely with your surgeons about that. GI prophylaxis, if you're intubated, in general, that patient should get GI prophylaxis. But you'll hear on rounds when we speak with our representation from pharmacy some of the complex issues regarding which patients exactly need GI prophylaxis. Uh, keeping the head of the bed greater than 30 degrees at all times, if you see that and it isn't right, as long as there's no surgical contraindication, work with the nurse and put the bed back at 30 degrees. This is to prevent aspiration. And then these last two, which have been and are currently extraordinarily important, and that every patient, every day, gets a daily sedation vacation and a daily spontaneous breathing trial assessment. And it's very important that every patient who's intubated, that you, as the house officer helping to take care of the patient, are working closely with the primary surgical team, the attending intensivist working with you, the respiratory therapist, and the bedside nurse to make that assessment. Some patients, you'll stop the sedation altogether. Some patients, you'll be decreasing their propofol drip by a very small amount, and that's all they can tolerate. But the point is that you've made this kind of daily assessment, and that's in the best interest of high-quality patient care, which is what we are all about here in the surgical ICU and here at Maimonides Medical Center.